The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly divided, the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, President of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today, and we do trust that our time together in God's Word will uh, provide a blessing and, and help to you as we look again into the pages of the Scripture to allow the Spirit of God to teach us through His Word. Uh, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter number 1 this morning, or today, and I want to look at two verses that really contain the secret that runs the universe. You know, if you could, if you could find the key behind everything that's running everything in the universe— I, that, that might be an interesting thing. Uh, in fact, it wouldn't just, and it might be, it would be. And the, the whole plot of the Bible, the Bible is the revelation of God about what's going on in the, in the universe. The greatest scientific textbook of, uh, of, of types, symbols, uh, and, and events in, in all the universe is the Word of God. The Bible is the only absolute moral authority in the universe. And in it is contained a, a, a storyline, a plot about a narrative about what's going on in the universe. And the key uh, that runs, the secret that runs the universe is right here in these two verses. Ephesians chapter 1, actually three verses, verse number 8, 9, and 10. Ephesians 1 verse 8, he says, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him, in whom we also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Notice that God is a counsel. He has a will. He has a purpose that he purposed in himself. He's got something he's doing with his universe. When Jesus Christ stepped out on nothing and said, call the universe into existence. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God had a purpose behind all of that. Verse number 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time. Now think about that. A dispensation is a particular set of instructions given by God for man's obedience. The dispensation of the fullness of times. A fullness of something is when something comes to its completion, it comes to its end, it comes to fruition. The dispensation of the fullness of times. Times are, are Time is what is the phenomenal dimension of creation. If you have the heaven and the earth, but you don't have time, you have length, breadth, and depth, the three dimensions of the cube, but you don't have time, then you cannot experience the, the physical creation. So we say we live in the time-space continuum. It requires time for us to experience uh, creation. You watch, a, you watch a video, and the video runs at about 30 frames per second. There's a movement going through there. And it, but if you freeze it, and there are no frames moving, there's no time lapsing, then everything just stops. Well, the dispensation of the fullness, the... The, the, when, when you get to the place where you understand the fullness, the, the goal, the purpose for which creation came into existence, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. The secret behind all things in heaven and earth, the secret behind it all, is that God the Father's original plan and purpose was to make Jesus Christ, make His Son, 
the center, the head of everything in creation, to make everything that he made center and focus in his son. Now you notice the way he describes what he made. Two realms, which are in heaven and which are in earth. There are, there's a heavenly realm and an earthly realm. The overall, the, the purpose of God is to glorify His Son as the head of all things in the earth, all things in the heavens. Now, when we talk to you about rightly dividing the word of truth and understanding your Bible dispensationally, what we're talking about is the fact that God has two agencies, one grand purpose in the universe to exalt His Son, but He's going to do it in two realms. One is in the earth, one is in the heavens. Hence, He has two agencies in the earth, he'll exalt the headship of Jesus Christ through the instrumentality of a kingdom vested in the nation Israel. Israel, his earthly kingdom people. He has a purpose to, to, to exalt his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the, in the heavens through the instrumentality of the church, the body of Christ, in that heavenly kingdom. Both of those agencies are have operating system. Standard operating position for, uh, system for Israel is the law. Standard operating system for the body of Christ is called grace. Both of those systems are revealed in a certain specific way. His purpose in the earth is, is, is that which is, is called prophecy. It's that which is spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. That's why you go in Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth. And it's the earth, it's the earth, it's the earth. He goes makes man out of the dust of the earth. And the earth is the focus all the way through from Genesis chapter number 1 all the way over till you come to the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. And Paul, the Apostle Paul has what he calls a heavenly vision. And the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven speaks. And now he's forming a, a, a heavenly vision. Uh, a body of believers called the church, the body of Christ, and we're to f set our affections on things above. Our issue is we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and that revelation given to Paul is called the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. So God had a plan and a purpose that he re in the earth that he revealed since he put man on the earth. Then he had a plan and a purpose in the heavens through the body of Christ that he kept secret until he revealed it through the apostle Paul. The secret here in the verse is that he's going to make everything focus in his Son. Now, when he mentions heaven and earth here, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, you notice how he says in verse number 8, we're in, talking about the riches of his grace. He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. How did he, how did he abound toward us in wisdom and prudence? having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. God the Father had a plan and a purpose before he created the heaven and the earth. Back before Genesis chapter 1, this purpose that he purposed in himself, he kept it secret. Before God created the heaven and the earth, he already had a plan. Come with me to the book of Proverbs. Uh, get Proverbs chapter 3 in one hand if you will, and Revelation chapter number 4. It's important for you to understand that creation was not something that just, you know, it wasn't like God just stepped out on, on nothing and threw spaghetti on, against the wall, and, you know, let's, let's just see what happens if I throw some stuff out there. It isn't that at all. That verse over there in Genesis 1 which says he made the stars also. He didn't just go and say, well, let me see if I can fling them out there. Job 20. 6 says that he, he placed them in specific places in the universe. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. When the four and twenty elders cast their crowns down before the Father. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. Now watch. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. You see, God created the things because He had a plan for thy pleasure. He had a purpose for them. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 19. The Lord, now listen, by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath He established the heavens. By His knowledge the depths were, are, are broken up and the clouds dropped down. Notice, it's by wisdom, it's by understanding. When he goes out here and creates the heaven and the earth and stretches them out, Isaiah says, 
He had a plan. He already had a blueprint. He had a master blueprint that he was going by. And if you look over in chapter 8, Proverbs chapter number 8, verse number 11, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that, that may be desired are not to be compared to it. I wisdom dwell with prudence, and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Notice, I wisdom dwell with prudence. In Ephesians 1.80 says, he hath, made, he hath abounded to us, us in all wisdom and prudence. There was a wisdom that God the Father had that dwelt with his prudence. Not just a wisdom, but a wisdom that was designed in a certain kind of way to show the prudence, the, the ability to see the big picture of what's going on. He had a genius of a plan. And he had a witty invention. <laughs> he had a creative genius. And by the way, I don't know if you, you, I love the way the Bible talks, a witty inventions. Um, God's creative genius has a sense of humor. I think about that every time I stand in front of a congregation to preach, whether it's a congregation of 10 or, 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 or a thousand. You look out there and you see all those faces and there's one, you, everybody's got a nose and a mouth and a chin, two ears and two eyes. And yet, you know, there's a lot of weird looking dudes that combinations of eyes, ears, nose and mouth and chins and cheeks and hairlines and stuff. And you look out there and you see whoever made this had a real sense of humor. <laughs> you know, he, you sure aren't bored looking around at people. I have a friend, he, he says, I, I don't, I like to look at people's feet. And, and he's, he, I, I, I I don't, I don't get off on looking at people's feet so much, but he does. And he says, you know, just like fingerprints are different, people's feet are different. And, uh, yeah, you know, the Creator had a sense of humor that expressed His wisdom dwelling with prudence in a creation, and He did it all so that it would honor the genius of His Son. Now, if you come with me to the book of Colossians, Go with me to Colossians chapter number 2. I'm sorry, Colossians chapter number 1. It's important to understand that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, that there was an issue. There is a fundamental issue that's being established there. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 16. Colossians 1, 16. For by Him, and that's by the Lord Jesus Christ, were all things created, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. So here we are, you have the earth, and He creates all these things in the earth, and then He creates the heavens. And He says all the things in heaven up here, and all the things on the earth, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, all those things are created by Him, whether they be, I'm sorry, visible and invisible. So there's some stuff that's invisible, you can't see it. Then there's some stuff that's visible, you can see. Well, we can't see that, but we can see this. Whether they be, now watch carefully, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Now, you can see some thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers on the earth. But there's also some thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers in the heavens up here that you can't see because they're up there, not down here. They're in a different dimension up here. They're in the world of the spirit world up here. They're in the invisible realm. Governmental authority, thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers were created in the earth. The same kind of governmental authorities are created in heaven up here. Amos chapter 9 talks about the, his stories, the, the layers of authority in heaven and the layers of authority in earth. You understand that. You understand how government operates. Now verse number seven, 16, all things 
All the positions of government in the earth and in the heaven were created by him. And, watch, for him. Now that's what Revelation 4.11 was talking about. For thy pleasure they are and were created. The Father created all this governmental authority. And the issue over here, listen, the issue from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Revelation chapter 22 is the issue of the authority of a throne over God's creation. God's throne, God's authority over creation. That's been the issue. When God, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, what did He create? He created thrones, dominions, principalities, and power, governmental authorities in the earth, governmental authorities in the heavens. And His intention was that all of those government authorities in the earth and in the heaven would focus on and exalt and honor His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and make Him the head of all of those things. And every one of them, they would honor Him. The whole shebang is about honoring Him. He is the key to the whole thing. Now I want you to look at something with me. Go back with me to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter number 14. There's something remarkable back here about creation and God's intention in His creation. Isaiah 14, verse number 12. Now Isaiah 14 is talking about, it's a prophecy. If I do it like this, I, maybe I can help. And I can't, I, if I erase all that, I'll, let me just walk across here like this. In Isaiah 14, you're reading a prophecy about the second coming of Jesus Christ back to establish His kingdom. You're seeing the nation Israel as they go into the kingdom mock Satan and the Antichrist who've now been defeated. When they do that, what they do is they recount to him his original plan. This was your original plan, Satan, and look what it's brought you. So what you're reading in Isaiah 14, beginning in verse number 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down which is to the ground which has weakened the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, Here's what his original plan was. Now I want you to notice verse 12, verse, verse 12 just for a minute before we get, get into the, the plan. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now that's his name. Luke's Pharaoh, the light bearer. In Job chapter 38 it talks about his strong right arm. His function was to stand at the head of creation and bear witness, and literally to lead creation. God made him, Ezekiel 20, it says he made Satan, he, he made him before he became Satan, when he was Lucifer, he made him the, the wisest, the smartest, the brightest, the most intelligent, the most beautiful creature. He was the sum of wisdom, the sum of beauty. Why did he do that? so that he could lead all of creation in the honoring of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. Now, I want you to notice verse 12 carefully again. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Notice what he calls him, Son of the Morning. God the Father desired a son to lead his plan of exalting his son, uh, uh, you know, the, exalting the Lord Jesus Christ as head of all things. In the Bible, a son is not simply a progenitor, a, 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 a progeny. A, a son is not simply your offspring. In the Bible, a son, the, the, term, the, the idea of adoption, is you take someone who is your offspring, your creation, and you put them at the position of adults. A son is someone who does willingly what a child or a servant is forced to do. A son is someone who understands what the father's doing and delights in what the father's doing and works with the father and works in, in, in hand in hand with the father, not just working with him, but delighting. He owns what the father's joy is. And he delights, Jesus said it, 
I delight to do thy will, O God. What God the Father was looking for was a son. And he, he appointed Lucifer to that sonship position. But Lucifer was lifted up by pride, 1 Timothy 3 says. And he took it to heart and he developed, he said, I can be smarter than God. Look how beautiful I am. And he was lifted up by pride and iniquity was found in him. Rebellion was found. You know what the lie is? The truth of God is turned into a lie. Romans chapter 1, verse 25 tells you that the, they take the truth of God and changed it into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. And you take the word sin, and that middle letter of the word sin is where it comes from. It's the lie program. Worshiping, and here it is. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into, the, into, into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the congregation of the mountain and the sides of the moon. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. By the way, that term Most High is defined in Genesis 14. The Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. The one who possesses all authority in heaven and earth. Satan is going to say, you know what? I'm going to take the place of of the one who possesses all authority in heaven and earth. I'm the one who deserves to be the son, not Jesus. And he fell into rebellion. And he devised his own plan to become God. Like the most, the possessor of the creation, the head of creation. Now go back with me, if you will, to Ephesians 1. So Satan has his plan to make himself head of creation, to usurp and take away from God, the Father, the position he intended for his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse number, Ephesians 1, verse 10, verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself. You ever realize that God Almighty has taken you into his counsel? <laughs> Literally taken you back into the councils before the foundation of the world and to the eternal decrees. Uh, people talk about that eternal life conference between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before he ever created anything. And has taken you into his confidence. Made known to you the mystery of his will. The divine wisdom... The divine prudence of God, wisdom that dwelt with prudence, its response was that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he would gather together and one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. He's going to have an agency to restore the headship of Jesus Christ in the earth. That agency is the nation Israel. Exodus 4, he said, out of Egypt if I call my firstborn son. Romans chapter 9, verse 4 says to, to Israel, pertains the adoption. He's going to give them that position of being his sons in the earth. The body of Christ, if you go back to verse number 4, verse number 5, Ephesians 1, 4, according as he chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and not blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. He's determined that we, his children, the ones in whom he's put his life, would be predestinated to be his sons in the heavens. And it will be through Israel, his adopted sons in the earth, who has come to delight in his will and work with him to do it the way he wanted and accomplish what delights the Father to rejoice in what he rejoices in, for you and I in the heavens. Now, that secret, verse 8 says, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. God's wisdom dwelt with prudence. And 
did this whole thing, this whole redemption thing, in such a way as to exalt his wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and see how the prudence of God, the wisdom of God and the prudence of God work together and how prudent he was in doing this. 1 Corinthians 2 verse number 7. For we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. He planned it before the world began, but he didn't reveal it till you came to the Apostle Paul. Which none of the princes... Of the, why did he keep it a secret? Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The conflict resolution about who is the authority... It resides not in who is the most powerful, but who is the one with the wisdom to operate the system. And God Almighty did something. He kept a realm of knowledge and in information secret so that when Jesus Christ was crucified, Satan motivates his crucifixion. It's through his death at Calvary that everything is accomplished. Because all that he does in the heavens and in the earth, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive glory and honor and power. Why? He's, a, he's a lamb that was slain. It's through the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ that all of the, his, his plan to exalt his son is accomplished. And he kept that secret. And it caused Satan to do the very thing that was his undoing. He took the wise in his own craftiness. The secret that runs the universe is the fact that everything, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge reside in and focus in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you study that book, you're studying about Him. And when you cherish Him, you're cherishing the secret to life. Till next time, Maranatha. Right